Hi, my name is Simon Parker. I'm the guest editor of Exhibition News, um, and I'm very happy to have today's guest. Um, I described him to himself actually as as the uh, the industry's biggest deal maker. So it's um, it, it's a title that I've conferred on him, but it's uh, arguably is the case um, in that he has been in this industry for a long, long time. Has done lots of transactions, um, particularly uh, in the event space. Um, he's also a regular contributor to EN, which you'll know, he's his deal maker column. Um, and before that, not everybody knows, but was um, was in the industry and, and, and worked for uh, for Blenheim as a, as a senior executive there. So, Steve, uh, welcome. Thank you. You've just moved house as well. So we've just it's been through the, the, the rigors of moving house. Uh, yeah, that's been, um, that's been interesting, but um, uh, you can't really take a break from work, so you just got to fit it around the edges. No, and I hope you don't mind me saying biggest deal maker, but um, how did you become so? Well, I don't think we are. Um, I mean, you know, we don't do the biggest deals, um, but we probably do more deals than other brokers, and certainly we've probably got the greatest coverage geographically. Um, and you know we've been doing this for twenty odd years, and I think the the smart thing that we did was that we decided to concentrate solely on events. Uh, we shut out all other adjacent sectors, and we're just um, very clear minded about the fact that we would primarily uh, represent entrepreneurs who wanted to sell their businesses, uh, their exhibition businesses. And we also decided to do that worldwide and not just concentrate on the UK. So we've done a lot of deals in many other countries from Turkey to the Middle East to Southeast Asia and China. And you know, the benefit of our industry being a small industry is that the international buyers are broadly the same wherever the deal is. So that's the first part of our equation. Um, that we've got great relations with the buyers. Um, we've got a reputation for making the process as straightforward and transparent as possible. And we're dealing with the same people, uh, whether we're doing a deal in, uh, in China or whether we're doing something in the UK, the, you know, the, the gatekeeper, if you like, at the, at the company, the head of M&A or strategy is yeah. the same person. So, so I think... Yeah. So if it, if it didn't fall within that criteria, then so you said you, you very consciously chose what you were going to do geographically and in terms of, you know, events. So if it, if it, it didn't fall within that, you wouldn't do it. No. So, you know, we've we've turned down we've turned down opportunities to sell a um, fruit packaging business in Turkey, who was the brother of one of the organizers who we sold. Um, it would have been very easy to be seduced into doing something like that. Um, you know, we, we turned down working for a computer services company who was the wife of a, of a, of a company who, uh, whose business we sold. And we even turned down doing event services businesses. And we just turned down an event tech sale as well, yeah. because we don't think that we're best placed to do it. And frankly, we're too busy with our core business. So, yeah, it's. Uh, some people may say, take on more people, you know, expand um, uh, horizontally. Uh, but no, we, we, we stick to what we know. And we know, you know, we know the prices, we know the multiples, we know the people, we know the process, and therefore we can, we can really specialise. We would never have been able to build a business we have if we, if we just stuck with the UK. We'd probably yeah. be out of business. So... Um, that's why we went to all these other markets. And, you know, the second part of the equation is the sellers. Um, and again, our clients generally haven't sold businesses before. Uh, we, you know, Anna and I um, uh, have been in business together for 20 odd years. And as a small business owner ourselves, we, we empathize with our clients, we, you know, and we hold their hands right the way through the process and we understand the issues that they have which some of the bigger corporate finance houses couldn't even possibly begin to imagine yeah. or even get their hands dirty helping people do stuff you yeah. know and stuff can cover can cover anything and it's i think it's our willingness to roll our sleeves up and get involved in whatever we need to to make the deal happen 
so, uh, he's so, also so if you if you cast your mind back then 20 years um how did you then end up i mean did you spot a gap or, or was this something that you'd always wanted to do so when i worked for blenheim i was i was working uh as the director of international business so i i basically ran the rule i was the gatekeeper for acquisitions so i ran the rule over all the businesses so we were working on the buy side and when we sold the business to United News and Media, as it was at the time, which I became UBM, um, I didn't want to stay in a big corporate company. And so I just made the decision to go and do this myself, but on the other side. And I thought it would be really straightforward. And I, I spent two years struggling to make an impression because when you work for a big company and you call somebody, you are that big company. When you, when you, that very same person, make the same call to, to an individual in another company, you're Steve Monington, and you get the PA saying he'll call you back. Yeah. Um, so it took a while, um, and you know we were a bit scattergun at first, and then we lucked into a number of deals in, in different places, and then we just, we just built it up from there through reputation. And I think the 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 final part of the jigsaw that has made us successful is that we we spend around 20% of our time giving free advice. Um, we will sit down with anybody and give them advice without any commitment at all. We used to run clinics um, when we had an office in Chiswick. Um, we'd invite people for a 45 minute slot and just, just help them. Yeah. And we still do that, albeit on the phone. And we don't worry about signing anything, about charging anything. And nine times out of 10, it will pay dividends. It will be good karma. You know, one time out of 10 people will just take advantage, but that's human nature. Yeah. So I think if you wrap all of that up together, that's, that's how we've survived, I suppose, for, for the last 20 odd years. So over that time, for people that don't know, uh, could you sort of give some flavour as to what deals you've done? I mean, obviously there's, there's lots, but if you'd like to pick a couple out, well, um, yeah, so we've done, we've done certainly well in excess of 100 deals. Um, um, and I think the three that I would pick out would be the sale of counterterrorism expo to Clarion. Yeah, um, that's Peter Jones. Peter yeah. And the reason I would pick that out was that he rang me before the first edition of the event and said, I want to sell the business. Can you invite some people to it? And it was a tiny show uh, at Olympia, I think. Or no, it was QE2. It was the QE2 centre. Um, was it? Yeah, it, it, was, yeah. it was really small. Yeah. And, and we invited several potential buyers. And they said, well, why would we want to, why would we possibly want to buy a, a show that's never run? So Peter said, look, just invite them anyway. The place was rammed. It wasn't hard to be rammed because it was small. And we got four offers within about seven days. And we sold the business for, well, put it this way, enough money for Peter to buy several fast cars on the boat and, <laughs> and, a house and, house, and a house for his mother and yeah. father. And, and, um, and that was, uh, that was a, an interesting deal. Yeah. Um, I think the second one I would pick out just because of the size, which is, was, was outside of our normal area of dealing with entrepreneurs, was when we co we, we were co-broker for the sale of Closer Still Media when they when Phoenix Equity sold to Inflection, so one PE to another, yeah, um, which was a hundred and thirty odd million pound deal, and that just exposed us to a side that we don't normally get involved in. Are they are they that much more complex? I mean, you're talking about bigger numbers and and uh, different transactions. I mean, yeah, I, I they they. Are they, they, they are more, I mean, they are more complex because they're bigger numbers, because private equity have a different way of doing things. Um, they have different, uh, almost different profit recognition um, um, models. There's a lot, lot, lot more modeling that goes on and a lot more rigor that has to go into the book. And because it's a bigger, because it's a bigger, uh, a bigger company, there's all of the uh, prepping for the management um, presentations, which are not the things you normally get when you've got a couple of entrepreneurs selling, you'll just sit down and have a chat across mm. the table. So yeah, 
it's it's a lot more complex and that and that was a very interesting interesting process is it, is totally it, is it more is it more sorry to is it more mechanical rather than i was just thinking about if you then con contrast that with the, the peter story or you know any other entrepreneur and largely those are businesses that that person has invested a lot of time effort sweat tears and everything it's it's their baby that they're transacting on and that's a, i guess that's a different dynamic to effectively totally. effectively what is a financial transaction it's it's only financial there is no emotion i mean when we work with entrepreneurs we we take them on an emotional journey and it and it goes through various cycles from from fear to delight to greed to whatever um with um with pe deals it's just about it's just about the money it's just about the numbers there is no emotion and yeah. it's not really the sort of thing that i particularly enjoy because i really like the kind of real human interaction and the journey that you take entrepreneurs on and i would say the third one just because it was hilarious um was when we sold a business in china home techs which is a home, big home, fur, home furnishing exhibition to tarsus they acquired yep. a majority stake and it was owned by 44 separate non-english speaking shareholders my god uh, and um they were uh they were um it, it was just a totally bizarre and surreal deal from beginning to end mm. um but we got loads of offers and we had a standoff at the end between two of the big organizers who made presentations one in the morning and one in the afternoon and then everybody voted in in chinese and oh my god it was it was it was it was, it was absolutely hilarious yeah. um and um the, the the fact that you could actually get 44 people in a, in a country in a foreign language actually agreeing about something yeah and that business you know three four however many years on now is going great guns and you know china is one of the markets uh, ironically is probably the only exhibition market that's been trading anywhere near full strength for the last year yeah um, it's good. that's in you i just just read your the latest copy for your deal maker and that's there's there's still deals happening there um oh yeah and, and oh, yeah and we're working on some at the moment uh, for sure um yeah. It's hotting up over there at the moment, and you know, people. It's the only market where there's been any real M and A activity. What I would call non-COVID M and A activity. Um, yeah. Uh, over the last few months. Well, let me. So, let, um, so, so of the, those hundreds. So, I mean, obviously, you know, some of them will stick um, very much in your consciousness. Others, you probably uh, want to forget. But what? In your view, you've, you've talked about three there that are highly memorable and, and all successful. Um, but what I, I, I'm guessing there's also stuff that hasn't worked so well. There's a whole body of work about, um, you know, sort of acquisitions not necessarily delivering the value that they, they promise. Um, what you know, what's that? What are those vital ingredients that make good deals? Um, well, I think if you've got if you're if you're selling a market leading show that's a good start um because because if you're selling a show which has got a lot of competition and you're trying to move owners at the same time and the and the uh sellers are either either disengage or you know are not particularly motivated because they've just got a load of cash in the bank and you've got new teams coming on at a time when you've got um when you've got strong competition um i think that you know that's that can be very tricky if you've got market leading events which are well underpinned um that kind of thing isn't going to happen and i think that when you talk about businesses that are working well several years on you know if you've got a deal you've got to have a deal that both parties are happy with if somebody feels screwed then it's not gonna it's not gonna end it's not gonna end happily yeah so Although we have a reputation for extracting, you know, quite high prices out of um, out of buyers, we always make sure that the deal. And again, this comes back to my original involvement with Lenin on the buy side. I can I can put the buyer's hat on and understand what they're thinking about things. And for us, the last part of a deal is is actually making sure it, for both parties it doesn't go off track. And it's not just about the, the headline price. There are tens and tens of, of 
points that need to be discussed, negotiated and agreed, which are often non-financial points, which are probably the things that um, uh, are the key areas for success um, versus failure. But yeah. actually, you, ne you never know what's going to happen. So we sold um, retail business technology um, about three or four years ago to read. Yeah. It was a two-year deal two-year earn out the team uh were contracted to run the show for the two years they stayed in their original offices they hit all their targets uh that were set out at the time they exceeded the earn out um estimates uh there was a perfect handover from the team to read uh everybody was really happy and then covid hit and for whatever reason, Reed decided very recently um, that they weren't going to run the show anymore um, and not sell it, but just walk away from the show. The mm. staff were told they were leaving. 19 Group, so we come back to Peter Jones again, have launched, um, yeah. grabbed the tenancy and the team and have launched their own event. Wow. So, you know, what, uh, and it's going great guns apparently. And, you know, they hired the team that were working for Reed, plus one of the original founders who had exited, one of the original shareholding founders. Um, and, um, you know, what was a relatively high priced deal with a perfect run in and handover now is, is no more and, and has a completely different team, but for reasons that you would never have expected. So, yeah. Yeah. But, is it, but it, I guess it's all, I mean, the dynamics of our industry is such, though, isn't it, in that, you know, the most uh, dominant player has only got, you know, high uh, single digit um, sort of um, percentage of market share. So you will always have this dynamic and you will always have those entrepreneurs. Uh, you'll always have those launch ideas. Uh, and I guess, the, 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 you know, and then and then and then the issue is about how those bigger you know and i worked for one for many years how we then absorb those businesses into our bigger corporate main yeah and and i think i i gave a i gave a um i did a keynote speech in uh, for the association in australia about three or four years ago and i think i surprised everybody by saying that our our industry depended on entrepreneurs and there, there was this kind of quizzical ripple that went through the audience and i said if you actually look at the portfolios of all of the big organizers you will find that 90 percent of the events uh, have their origins in an acquisition from an entrepreneur yeah and actually if you look at the shows that have been launched which are not uh replications of those shows or product extensions of those shows but pure launches in their own right by the larger organizers there are very few so there's this kind of feeding cycle, isn't there? Yeah. Um, that without the entrepreneurs, the, the big organizers wouldn't exist. Yeah. And for the big organizers to continue to grow, you need those entrepreneurs to be developing businesses. And you know, people see guys making, uh, people uh, making a lot of money, they're friends, because it's a very uh, incestuous industry. They go to the pub, they see somebody who's just sold their business for you know five million pounds. They're working for Reed or Informer or DMG, or whatever, and they've got a salary of whatever. And they think, sod this, I'm gonna leave. So they leave and they set up their own event, and within three or four years they've sold it, and and so on and so on. So you've got this constant cycle. Uh, and at the end, all of the events end up with the big guys. Yeah. But it, and it works for the big guys as well, because ultimately what they're doing is outsourcing their R&D uh, and then buying it effectively to scale, you know, which is what then, you know, that they tend to do, whether it's geo cloning or adding other aspects to it or giving it, you know, the resource to be able to do that. So yeah. it's, a, it's a virtuous circle that should work for everybody. No, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Providing you can get to that, you know, your win-win situation where you, you know, you're selling things at a reasonable multiple. So, so on on the, the multiple question, and I, I won't ask you specifically about what multiple. Well, I will actually. In terms of what's happened to what's what's happened in COVID, and you know, are people's um, uh, are multiples going down? Well, obviously there hasn't been that many deals, so 
Um, but how do you see it playing out? So um, if you look at the deals that have happened during COVID, they have been either um, non-core sales um, so you know, we ourselves have handled a number of disposals for Hive. Um, they have been uh, COVID-related deals, uh, in particular associations, and in particular in America, where because they've been non-profit organisations, they haven't benefited from government financial support, but at the same time, they own a show, which is the main source of income for them to run their membership. So we've seen a number of a number of associations sell their shows. Um, you know, we haven't seen many what I would call normal deals, um, and we don't have the data today on uh, to be able to say this is what has happened to multiples. But what I can tell you is that during COVID, we probably took. 40 or 50 calls from people who, generally from people who weren't in the sector, but some who were, who were looking for fire sale prices. And there was nobody who wanted to sell their business uh, at the bottom of the V, you know, having spent five, six, eight, 10, 15 years building it up, nobody was about to, to, to sell it at those levels. And I think what people didn't understand was that the organizers have all managed to roll over probably 80 to 90% of the revenue that they collected from exhibitors that were going to be, that was going to be for the 2020 show. And that has enabled them to trade. In addition, people have been forced to enhance their publishing if they've had it, and also to launch digital businesses. Uh, I was talking to a company today who said that they made as much money in 2020 as they did in 2019. Wow. Because their digital revenue is, they've got no cost. Yeah. So their revenue was down, their profit was up. Because uh, the margin was, was better, yeah. Because, because of better margins. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that we're going to see this big drop in multiples that people were, some people were expecting. I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, and I guess it, it goes a long way to um, to say that the, the, the sector is resilient as well, because, you know, obviously implicit in that is that it's going to come back and it's going to come back strong. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think I mean, what is really interesting is that I think that we're in a we're in a bit of a false position right now because of this rollover of exhibitors. So everybody's looking at Q4. Uh, shows and Q1 next year shows and they're sitting on all these um, all this money they're sitting on all of these contracts and the exhibitors have spent the money out of last year's budget mm. and they have to be there so they will be there but it's a false situation because it's not they're not going because of their own free will they may want to go they may want to go more now than they did before but we just don't know yeah. because they've They've got, they've got to go because they've, they've spent the money. So it won't be until that show has run that, they, um, that the organiser has shown that they can deliver a meaningful audience and therefore the exhibitors re-sign for the next edition that we will really know uh, how likely things are going to get closer back to normal. Yeah, and I, and I guess that's going to be a you know we've it's well documented, but I'm I'm guessing it's going to be different what sector that you're in and what yeah. what geography you're in, and you know you talked about China. China's been you know you go to China now as if nothing's happened. Yeah. Similarly, you, the US is moving in that direction. Big strong domestic markets. Yeah, um, I think the you know what one of the big unknowns at the moment is travel. Yeah, not just not just whether people can travel, but whether people want to travel. So. You know, it'd be very interesting to see what happens to the, the big international shows with strong international uh, exhibitor contingents or visitors. Um, so things like um, um, Reed's um, World Travel Market, for example, it could be very interesting to, to yeah. um, see, see what happens to, to those events. And, and you mentioned um, in one of your three examples, one of was a pure PE to PE sale. 
Um, and I'm guessing that that's a big change in terms of, you know, over those 20 years that you've been operating. Um, P wasn't really interested at the beginning. And they've obviously yeah. cottoned on uh, and, and seen this as a, a way of, you know, flipping businesses at, at um, sizable profits. How has that changed the, uh, the, the sort of dynamic of what you do? Well, I mean, absolutely spot on. We used to have a saying, um, which was the usual suspects. Yeah. Um, when we looked at deals. And I remember in one year, you know, Reed did, Reed did 22 deals and UBM did 26. And, uh, you know, and, won that every, race. And, 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 every, and everybody else did, together did about 12. Um, you know, an informer to a lesser extent, because in those days they were more uh, into conferences and yeah. business information. But um, now if you look at, at, at their acquisition activity, it's much more targeted, it's much more low key, or it's, it's stuff that moves the needle. So UBM's acquisition um, over, in, um, over in Asia of um, um, World, World Cup, what's the name of it? It's gone out of my head now. All world, um, all world, yes. Yeah. Um, and then obviously, Informer's acquisition of UVF. Uh, so you know, me me meaningful things rather than lots of small deals. Mm. But today, it's largely about private equity, um, and so it's no longer just about strategic fit, as it is with the uh, with the um, uh, with the non financially owned businesses like Reed and UVM. It's about growth in general. Yeah. And it's also around the timing around the sale of the business and the income PE firm. So, you know, I mentioned Closer Still selling from Phoenix to Inflection. I mean, you know, Closer Still are now on the, their fourth iteration of private equity ownership. I think that uh, Clarion are probably on their fifth. Um, and the time horizons mean that they're very unlikely to do a deal in the last six to 12 months of their ownership um, and very likely to do as many deals as possible in the first year of the uh, of their uh, you know as the as the next uh, as the buyer PE buyer comes in and wants to spend the money yeah. as quickly as possible in order to get as much growth as they can to enhance their exit price at the end and so it goes on yeah and that and that and that has what the that's what the industry has become, and you know it that's not going away. Um, you know if you look at if you look at private organisers that that are now PE owned. I mean, apart from you know the big closer stills and the and the Clarions, um, you know you've got you've got Nineteen Group now, um, which is owned by Phoenix, who are the second uh, owner of Closer Still. Um, and then you've got individuals being backed by private equity. So the announcement this week um, from Eagle Tree, which is yeah. Eagle Tree, isn't it? Yeah, Eagle Tree. It is, yeah. For ARC, for Simon, Simon Foster's uh, backing. And of course, he, he gets private equity through his involvement with Comexposium, um, and uh, who were owned by Charterhouse, who privatized and bought um, Tarsus. So, you know, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of musical chairs, except, except in musical chairs, you're, you keep taking one chair away, but in this version of musical chairs, you keep adding one um, and, um, or two. Yeah. So, you know, we are, we are getting to a stage now where private equity owned companies is the norm for uh, both operating, but also for acquisitions. Um, and as I say, it's, it means that acquisitions are less strategic um, because they will, they're more open to look at new sectors. Um, and I think the other thing that's changed is that their processes are probably more rigorous because they don't know the sector as well. Um, and therefore, they rely a lot more on commercial due diligence than some of the um, more established organisers do. Yeah, who've got teams of people who understand the sector because they're buying a show and they they're already running six shows in their portfolio and they know it so well. The private equity guys don't. So, 
um, those deals take longer because they're more rigorous and with a lot more box ticking that goes on through, um, through, I mean, everybody does financial due diligence, but the commercial due diligence is a lot more prevalent. So, so a final question really that, that kind of relates to that. So within that world, if you had one piece of advice for a seller, what would it be now? Um, take your time, be very considered, don't get seduced by uh, anybody who's offering something to you. Greeks offering um, gifts. Yeah. Um, talk to a number of companies. You know, I mean, we, we, and, and we would as brokers, wouldn't we, um, talk about these things, but I genuinely believe that if you're going to, because the other thing that has happened is that people don't want sellers who exit immediately. Therefore, there's a lot of deals being done where the seller continues to hold a stake or has a long-term burnout or an involvement. And for that reason, it's not just about the money. So, you know, running a process and, and talking to a number of buyers will first of all give you competitive bidding um, and therefore should logically increase the value that somebody pays, uh, increase the price that somebody pays for your business because if they don't bid the right price, somebody else gets it. Whereas if it's a one-to-one -one and they don't bid the right price, then you just reject it and they come back with something slightly higher until you do say yes. Yeah. And um, make sure, and, and just talk to a number of companies because they're all different. They all offer something different. The teams are different. And I, and I think that the entrepreneurs sometimes make a mistake by basing a decision by talking to the business development team. And once they've sold the business, they will never see the business development team again. They will be working with the show teams, with the, the commercial, commercial teams. teams. Yeah. And therefore, they need to sit down and talk to the commercial teams and understand how their show fits in and what life is going to be like and what can be offered. Um, so, so my advice is um, don't sell too early. Yeah. Don't wait until all the growth has gone out of the event, which is a typical entrepreneurial thing to do to say, well, I'm going to grow by another 10% next year so I won't sell. At some stage, it will flatten off. Yeah. Leave some growth on the table for the buyer and do your homework and talk to at least three or four potential um, partners or buyers before you make a decision. Do you advise the, the, the buyer on that integration strategy as well? Because that's sometimes where these, you know, if you look at, we were talking about yesterday, EcoBuild arguably um, didn't work for lots of different reasons. We won't go into that now, but one of which was, you know, how sensitively it was integrated. Yeah, or not. Um, or not. Yeah. The, the, no, I mean, you know, the, the buyer is responsible for integration. Um, the, seller, um, the seller should have a say in that. So we, we get involved in as much as we make sure that the seller, if there is an earn out, that they're not going to suffer through bad integration. Um, if they're leaving, then you know, it's not up to us. Um, and I go back to retail business technology, two year deal. Um, we were involved closely in how the negotiations went for how that business was run for those two years because we were protecting our clients' earnout, which they exceeded. Um, so we will get involved when it matters to the price. Yeah. But generally, than that on a commercial basis it's not it's it's not our it's not our um, our area i just having seen both sides of it i i feel that sometimes you're right all the energy is put into the deal uh and then once it's bought um the energy seems to go elsewhere because as you rightly say the m and &E, m and a team move on to something else the commercial yeah. team haven't necessarily had that much um experience or exposure to this type of deal so sometimes yeah. that's where it goes wrong yeah, but that's really up to the buyer, isn't it? Of course it, it is. Yeah, of course get, it is. Yeah. To get, get their process sorted out. Yeah, good.
Steve, we could talk for hours, literally, and it's been absolutely thrilling to speak to you and, and really interesting. Um, are you positive about the out, you know, the sort of outlook and, and where we're at at the moment? Yeah, I am. I mean, you know, where, you know, we, in March 2020, we had all our deals put on hold. Um, you know, nobody wanted to buy without, you know, with all the uncertainty. And I think the good thing is that those deals still remain on hold. Um, you know, people haven't walked away. Um, they're still interested in buying them. And I think the last six weeks for us has shown a big spike in both buyer interest and seller planning. So I think there is a lack of activity, acquisition activity from informer and read at the moment. Um, and that's making other buyers want to accelerate their uh, processes uh, whilst there's less competition. Um, the sellers who were committed sellers pre-COVID are keen to get on with it. Um, a lot of the buyers, when they talk to companies uh, who, and, and they try to suggest that they should sell, are being given short shrift at the moment because companies who, who were not committed sellers are being approached to sell and they just want to keep their heads down and give another their next show. Okay. So I think that we're not going to see a sudden spike um, until we go through this next series of events and <clears throat> we've got the re-sign, as I said earlier, to get out of this false position. So people have run the show, we've got the re-sign, we've seen the visitor numbers and once we've got visibility, then we'll see a surge. So I would expect to see a surge at the beginning uh, in the first half of 2022. Okay. Um, and, um, and a kind of gradual uh, re-emergence of, of deals uh, between now and then. Okay. Well, I think amen to all of that. And we certainly want to see the sector coming back and we want to see more deals and we want to see you being part of it. So Steve, thank you very much indeed for your wise words. Enjoy your new house. And um, thanks again. It's a pleasure. Thank you.